grasp your word, Holy Spirit, and Spirit, that you would apply it to our inner man and woman. So, Lord, that we would glorify and praise you all the more. In Jesus' name, amen. So you're at school, you're in secondary school, and you're in science class. And this day it is, of course, chemistry. It's not biology or physics, today is chemistry. And your teacher comes and puts in front of you a little beaker, and it has a solution in it. And says to you, identify for me, or tell me, whether this solution is acidic, or an acid, or a base. So how do you do that? The answer, of course, you do the litmus test. You get this particular type of paper, of a particular color, and you put it in, and if it changes, then it tells you what the solution is. It helps you to identify whether it's an acid or a base. Well, that's all well and good for chemical solutions. But how do you identify a godly leader? How do you identify a faithful under-shepherd? Well, I put to you this evening that this is the two parts of the test. The first is whether this under-shepherd preaches and teaches the Word of God. That is, the good news of Jesus according to the Bible. But that's not all of the test. That probably was obvious to most of us here. The second part, though, is just as important and also is found in this text when it talks of leaders, is not only do they teach the truth, do their lives testify to their faith? Do they live out their trust in Jesus? That is the second part of the test. Both are true, both parts, for godly under-shepherds and servant leaders. So in our text this evening, we are going to see leaders mentioned. Mentioned right at the beginning and then right at the end. And let me just clarify, the leaders specified here are godly leaders, faithful under-shepherds, faithful servants. That must be said in light of the commands that we're going to read. These are faithful leaders. And they are faithful leaders under the chief shepherd. For, of course, no pastor is the head of the church. Only Christ is the chief shepherd. So thus, all who serve as pastors, overseers, and elders are under him. They are, indeed, under shepherds. That said, the text here as a whole teaches this point. Because of Christ's supreme cleansing sacrifice, continue trusting him and living a life of praise to God through Jesus. That is the main point that our text teaches. It taught it first to the first readers, and it teaches it just the same to us today as followers of Jesus. So let's get into the text then. Remember that the context here, we've said this many times, but we must say it every time so that we understand the Bible in context, is this is written to people of a Jewish background who have become Christians. And at this particular point in their lives, the persecution, the suffering they're receiving from the world has caused them to be tempted to withdraw from Jesus and go back into Judaism, the Old Covenant, because there their community will not persecute them and they will be safe from the suffering that they've been enduring. That's the temptation. So the writer to the Hebrews presents to them Christ as supreme over all and tells them to trust him and not to return to social safety by abandoning Christ. The first point then and section is verses 7 to 9. Here the author teaches that they are to hold fast to God's unchanging gospel, the good news of Jesus, and their faith, their trust in him. Look with me at verse 7. He begins this section then with the example of their old leaders, those that now are deceased and are in the presence of the Lord, but that first founded this church and may, may well have been those who first preached the gospel to them, but those in the early part of this church's life who were foundational and taught the gospel. So he refers to them and says, Remember them, your leaders, your pastors, those who spoke to you the word of God. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. These were faithful leaders. He says also, Consider the outcome of their way of life. 
So not only did they teach the truth about Jesus, were they faithful to the word, their lives also, their daily conduct testified and confirmed that they did indeed trust him. They were consistent in what they said and how they acted. He says, remember them, consider the outcome of their way of life. Outcome here means achievement. He's referring, when he says their way of life, to all of their life. Their daily life, their conduct, all the way through to their death, in which they glorified God, in which it was a triumph of faith. And so he points them back to these leaders. And lastly, in verse 7, he's doing all this because he's saying, imitate their faith. Notice it doesn't say imitate them completely. We don't worship them Imitate their trust and dependence on Jesus Christ. It is a good and right thing to imitate the faith of faithful ones. Because we're not worshipping them, we're worshipping the God that they worship. And we're seeing in them good examples of those who trust not in themselves, but in Jesus for all things. But the point here is this, in this, these, this phrase, outcome of life or way of life, all of their life testified that they trusted in Jesus. And that's why they are examples to be imitated. So that's how he begins. Verse 8, he continues. Remember, he's been talking here about the unchanging truth, the message of Jesus, the very Word of God. Jesus Christ, that is Jesus the Savior, is the same yesterday and today and forever. What's meant here in context, he says, the message doesn't change. The message of Jesus the Savior isn't one thing yesterday and then today different and the next day another thing. We think of this in context of what Nick preached this morning from John 14. He doesn't, he's not the way yesterday but then today there's many ways. No, he is the way. Yesterday, today and forever. The message doesn't change. And we see that so clearly in verse 9 as he's about to show. But before we go there, why does the message not change? It doesn't change because Jesus doesn't change. The fact that he is constant, the fact that he is faithful, means the good news of him and salvation, sins forgiven, new life with God, through his death and resurrection and ascension and his earthly life of perfection before the Father, is an unchanging good news. It never, ever changes because he is utterly trustworthy. Why does he say all this? Verse 9. He then instructs them, he calls them, do not be led away by diverse, that is various, and strange teachings, plural. Again, there is only one good news of Jesus Christ, that he alone is saviour. So a various teaching would be some variation that's different from that, that says he's not the only way. No, there's not many teachings of Christ, there is the teaching and good news of Jesus. So the warning here is not to be led away into any strange or diverse teaching that is incompatible with the teachings of Jesus. No, instead, they're not to be led away. They're not to be taken away by these things. He says, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace. Grace, favor that we don't deserve. Grace personified in the person and work of Jesus in his cross, his resurrection, and his ascension. There is favor that us as sinners did not and do not deserve, but God has lavished upon us. What an amazing thing. This is grace. This alone, Jesus Christ, who he is and what he's done, alone strengthens the inner person. What's the alternative? Verse 9, he continues. Not by foods which have not benefited those devoted to them. He's most likely here referring to the sacrificial rituals of Judaism, the sacrificial meals of Judaism. For those still in the old covenant who haven't trusted in Christ, all of their observance of the law, what good does it do? Does them no good at all because they're not in Christ. The saving work of Christ and his bloodshed is not availed for them. Not yet. And if they stay in that state, it will never have availed for them. So all of their ritual keeping of the old covenant that now is fulfilled and made obsolete has been superseded in Christ, does not benefit them at all. We need to be strengthened in the inner man and woman by the truth and the grace of God in Jesus Christ. That alone, him alone, he alone, strengthens the heart. 
And then in verses 10 to 16, we have our second section. And this is really the sort of central point of the text, verse 10 in particular. The point of this section is this. Christ is our better cleansing sacrifice. So, how do we respond? Praise God. Which means publicly thank Him. Publicly declare His goodness and grace to you. Praise God with all of your life. Your whole life. Every single part. Verse 10 then, we, says the writer to these Christians, we have an altar, a place of sacrifice, from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. It's an amazing sentence, this, an amazing statement of truth. We have an altar, we have a place of sacrifice. This is referring to the cross itself, upon which Jesus died, fulfilling the saving and rescuing mission of God for all who trust in him. Sins forgiven and eternal life given, all by God's grace, all by that bloodshed, all by his atoning sacrifice. We have an altar. But notice what it says, from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. The point here is this. Those in the old covenant, those in Judaism who haven't trusted in Christ, the Levitical priests, have no right to partake of this sacrifice. No right at all. Context behind this verse and the next few that explain it is Leviticus 16. Our author has already a few times alluded to or referred to the Day of Atonement in the Old Covenant. And this was where on one day a year the sins of the people could be made atoned or made atonement for. But it was all very particular. It was all very particular because only the high priest could go in and make these sacrifices. And we're going to see those particular parts that he refers to next. But the point is this. If you don't have Christ, you have nothing. Nothing. So think about this in the context. To those who are Jewish by background and tempted to go back into Judaism to avoid suffering from their community. He says, if you were to go back and somehow you don't have Christ anymore, what would you have? Absolutely nothing. Nothing. Sins not forgiven. Why? Because it is his sacrifice alone that saves. So those in the Levitical priesthood, they have no right to this whilst they walk away from Christ and walk in rejection of him. In verses 11 and 12, he just further explains the point he's made in 10. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. This again is from Leviticus 16. The sin offerings, you see, were uniquely offerings where the the priesthood, the Levitical priests, could not eat. They couldn't take of the flesh and eat. Because these offerings, again from Leviticus 16, are specifically, the blood is shed, the animal is killed. But then the body, in fact all of the animal, is then taken outside of the camp and burned. They had no right to eat of that sacrifice. And so an analogy is here, an illustration that connects and points to Christ. He says in verse 12, So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. In that the body of this animal was sacrificed for the sin offering, we have pointing to and thus fulfilled in Jesus. Here referring to the historical reality of where Jesus was crucified. It was Roman practice to crucify outside of the city. God's word confirms that Jesus, at the place in which he was crucified, was outside of the holy city, outside of the temple. Here is the altar for all who will believe. And in case it passes you by, let me just pause for a moment here and say this amazing truth. That's all information on one level. But do you hear why it's so important? Because in this place of unholiness, outside of the precinct, outside of the camp, outside of the prescribed place of holiness, where we in our sin reside, God came. He came there in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And his perfect sacrifice took place in that place of our unholiness, outside of the camp. How incredible. 
We could not be made holy by any of our efforts. That old covenant was only existing to point to its fulfillment in Christ. God came to us at our place of need. In Jesus, he was sacrificed. He died the death we deserved. And he did all this by him coming to us, not the other way around. Praise God for salvation in Christ. What a message. What a glorious salvation we have. God has come to us in Christ and fully and completely saved us in our place of need. When we couldn't come to him, he has come to us in Christ. Brothers, sisters, ought we not to praise? Ought we not to magnify the name of Jesus because of who he is, our Savior and our Lord? Verse 13, response, the author says to these believers then, Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. He says, now look at, in light of Jesus' wonderful atoning, cleansing from sin sacrifice outside the camp for you. Look at the cross, brother, sister, he says. Now, in light of that glorious truth, look at your sufferings. Let us endure. Let us bear reproach. Christ, imagine and remember, saints, that Christ endured the reproach of this world. When he was crucified, they mocked, they spat. His body was torn. He was tortured publicly in the most shameful way. Indeed, in Jerusalem, the Jewish leaders, his most ardent enemies, he has his most fierce critique for them. Christ suffered reproach. He bore reproach. He endured it for us, despising that shame so that he would save us. So, says the author, saints, consider your suffering now, but at the hands of the world, the persecution you endure, and praise God because you get to suffer for Jesus, because of how much he suffered for you. What a powerful message to Christians in the midst of suffering. What an encouragement and a comfort this message is. Verse 14, he tells them to remember their final destination. For here, in this earth, in these earthly cities, we have no lasting, no abiding city. But we seek the city that is to come. We heard of it this morning. The eternal heaven of God. The Father's house with many rooms and much room, all room for his people. This we look forward to. This is coming with the return of Jesus. And before then, Christians who die are in the very presence of Christ, awaiting his coming back and the fullness of the glory and kingdom of God. We belong to the eternal city. Again, an encouragement. And then a summary in verse 15. Through him, says our author, that is through Christ, then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. Continually, our whole lives through Jesus are to be ones that magnify God, praise Him. The whole Christian's life is to be a life of praise. So we, have, we have so much to be thankful for. Aren't we to be praising Him in every aspect, in thought, word, and deed, praising the name of God because of Christ? It is a sacrifice of praise to God. And he explains that is the fruit, the produce of lips that acknowledge his name. Those that have trusted in Christ. Those who acknowledge the name of God. Those who are privileged to be his people. We are privileged to praise him. We are saved to praise him. That is why we exist. And then verse 16. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Not only are we privileged to praise him, to suffer for him, we're also privileged as his church, as his people, to do good, to live out our faith. Again, the word proclaimed, the good news of Christ, and a life lived in obedience and faith to Christ. Go together, they're not separate. And what does this look like within the church? It looks like us sharing the blessings that God has given. Earlier in this very chapter, remember it began in verse uh, one, let brotherly love continue. It is the mark of the church that we love one another. 
how many of us can give praise and testimony to the fact of gracious, loving saints who have blessed us with such generosity that we did not deserve. But it was their privilege, and it is our joy to be united in faith in Christ with them so that the outworking of their faith means they share out of love for God and love for the brothers and sisters. And then lastly, verse 17, he returns to the leaders. So he introduced their old leaders who are now with the Lord and said, imitate their faith, imitate the fact that they held fast and taught them, preached the word of God, as well as lived it out. And now he returns to the leaders, but now referencing their present leaders. He says, obey. And this word here means to be persuaded and so obey. It's not domineering. It isn't top down. It is instead to persuade and so thus to be Come obedient to these people. Obey your leaders and submit to them. Why? For the reason given next, for they are keeping watch over your souls. Amazing statement. That doesn't mean they become God. No, far from it. No, we are still servants ourselves. The great metaphors, and we must mix them, for the Bible gives us so many, and it's right that it does, that those who serve as elders and pastors have such great responsibility. But they never cease to be sheep themselves. You know that. How easy it is to see man-made top-down structures invade the church. To go to churches, and I've been to churches, where the pastor has stood in the pulpit, or one of the pastors, and said, you must give me money because I go before the Father for you. And to the point of even having pledges and people having to stand and explain why they haven't given as much as they should. I've been in churches where that has happened, and it is utterly, utterly wrong. Pastors are under-shepherds who serve God. Their authority is derived, it is given by the chief shepherd. It is not their own. And so, for godly pastors, you are to obey, he says here, your leaders, and submit to them why they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. What a sobering truth this is for those of us in pastoral ministry, to give an account. It's meant here as an account for our service to God. We're serving and serving God and his people as pastors. But of course also, in that account, we're an account of the flock that we have served. This means, of course, that this should affect the quality of the leadership. It should be humble. It should be serving. It should not glorify self. No, the elders and pastors are to glorify Christ and so love the body, the other sheep of which they themselves are sheep, that they minister to them, serve them, build them up in the faith. That can and does at times include challenge and rebuke. But all of this for their good and the glory of God and the glory of Christ. And then he says these words, let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. The point he's saying here is this. He says to this congregation, have unity in Christ. Obey and submit to godly, faithful leaders. Why? So that these leaders on the day of visitation, on the day of reckoning, when they stand before God, that they can give the report joyfully. A report of unity a report of gospel unity, that the church has grown, that we've worked through our differences, that we've forgiven one another, and we have matured together in Christ to the glory of the Father. Rather than a sad report, a sad report that even though the grace of God is so wonderful, instead, God's people are bickering, divided, unwilling to submit to godly leaders, instead taking the spirit of this age and refusing to obey, even though these leaders are serving sacrificially and well, and saying, no, we're doing our own thing. That is a church divided, and one that will be a very, very sad report on that day. What a challenge, both to the quality of those who lead and their leadership, and the quality of obedience and submittance to godly leaders, of those in the rest of the flock. It's a challenge to both, not just to one. And I praise God for it. So how should we all then respond 
Well, quite obviously, we should respond, particularly thinking of verses 10 to 16, with praise to God. Consider what's been said here. Consider the wonder, the beauty, how amazing the sacrifice of Christ truly is. That God, in all of his perfection, his holiness, his justice, his perfect righteousness, the creator of all things and of me and of you and of all humans, would come to sinners in the place of our unholiness and in Christ and by his cross save us. What a God. Should we not be led to praise? And I say to you this evening, if you do not currently trust in him, you know of him, but you do not yet trust him yourself, do so right now. Let me implore you. You have no other greatest need. We have lots of needs, but there is the greatest need of all to know and trust in Jesus. So that this cleansing sacrifice, his blood shed, would have dealt with our sin. And so we'd be made alive to God in Christ. That is every single human being's greatest need. And I urge and implore you tonight to trust Jesus and know that that blood was shed for you. That that go to him thus outside the camp, bear the reproach of the world, suffer for Jesus, and know that you are saved and you belong to him. To feast on Christ is a, a difficult metaphor in English, but it's not really a tough metaphor at all. In John 6, Jesus said he was the bread of life. And only for those who eat his flesh and drink his blood, Jesus said, would they have eternal life. Only those. What does he mean? Well, he explains in John 6 quite clearly. It is a figurative, metaphorical usage that points to believing, trusting in him. To believe in Jesus is to partake of him and the salvation from sin that is only available through him. We, as brothers and sisters in Christ, have trusted in him by God's grace, and we have partaken of Christ, and so we belong to him. What a message, what a God, what a Savior. Second, as here the believers are encouraged, told to remember their old and faithful leaders, I say to you this evening, remember, consider the lives the gospel, preached to you maybe many years ago. And praise God. And praise God for how he's worked through faithful servant leaders who preached the word but also lived it out. They didn't just say, do this, do this. You saw how much they loved God. There was no disparity between the gospel they preached and the gospel they lived. They didn't live like the world. They lived a life of sacrifice, of praise through Christ. To God in all of the things they did. Remember them and praise them and imitate their trust and their faith. So we are freed from sin and the, the judgment that is deserved for all sinners in Christ because it's been paid. We are called then, brothers and sisters, to live a whole life of praising God. And I'll end with this. The word hallelujah struck me this week. You hear it, you actually hear it quite a lot in secular circles every now and then. Hallelujah will mean something's good or surprise. It will mean even a sort of vague spirituality. What does it actually mean? To say hallelujah means praise God. Or let God's name be praised. Let God be praised. We as Christians are to live a life of hallelujah where every aspect of our lives are saying and living out, praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah is a word that belongs to God. And we, as those who belong to him, have the right and the privilege to partake of that sacrifice. And those of us who have, who've trusted in Jesus, now can live a life of praise to God, a life of hallelujah in speech, a life of hallelujah in action, a life of that glorifies God and God alone. So let's do that. Let's this week as God grants, if the Lord tarries and does not return, for he is returning, but if he tarries, let us live and press on to praise him, to live an entire life of hallelujah. We're now going to turn to the Lord's Supper. This is where we as God's people 
have the privilege of remembering Him. We do this in obedience to Christ's very command. To remember Him, to remember what He's done. And we don't just remember, it's also a celebration. And on top of that, as we partake here, as those who trust in Christ, for this is for Christians and Christians alone. If you do not yet trust in Him, please, let the elements pass. 